Good morning. It's good to greet you here in the name of the Lord this morning. Unfortunately, I'm not too well this morning. Uh, it is Sunday for me, but it is super early and uh, I've made the decision to record this early uh, so I can go back to where I've come from. <laughs> it's good to welcome you. We're going to start today's service by proclaiming and listening to a proclamation who and what God is. There is a life that comes from God. He is the resurrection and the life. There is a spirit who breathes in us. His spirit is with us and within us. There is a truth that sets us free. God is truth. In him there is no falsehood at all. There is a love that fills our heart. God is love. In his presence is peace. We believe in a living God, a risen saviour. May we bring the light and life of Jesus into a dark and dying world. Give us gladness in sharing good news and fill us with fearlessness. Let us be true disciples. Touch our lips that we may speak of you. Let's pray together. Father God, this morning as we come together in this different way that's starting to feel normal, we pray that you'll be with us. We'll pray that you'll grant us peace. We'll pray, well, I pray that we will be able together this morning to be able to put aside the things of the concern to us, that we will be able to focus on you and your amazing grace this morning. Amen. Start with scripture. And the scripture reading this morning is taken from John 20, 19 to 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and said amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw Jesus. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. He said, Receive the Holy Spirit, for you forgive, for you forgive anyone's sin. Their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. He said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas, told Je Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's sing together. There is a Redeemer.
I wonder how you're feeling today. It's kind of ironic that I'm asking that question when I'm clearly not too good this morning. It's a migraine, it's not anything uh, sinister. But when we look at the scripture that we've read just a moment ago, we see something in the disciples that was a little bit different. We'd seen this over the weeks previously, uh, that previous week, sorry, the Easter week. We'd seen Peter deny Jesus. We'd seen Judas betray Jesus. And now, even after the resurrection, here we see Thomas doubting Jesus. But something's happened to the disciples. Something's happened since the resurrection. They're back together again. They're no longer scattered. They haven't run away. Something's changed. The resurrection has brought about a different feeling for them. They're new. They are different. And much of our worship this morning is going to concentrate on uh, being changed and and revitalized and re-energized and later on we'll hear from our territorial commander as he speaks about taking risks in order to continue God's work in our communities in this difficult time. I'm just going to read you a second scripture taken from Acts 4 32 to 35. And it really shows the difference between the scattered group of doubting people to where they got to after the resurrection. Acts 4, 32 to 30. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. but They shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there was no needy people amongst them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to everyone who had need. We're going to listen to a band piece now called Ask. Quickly chosen this morning for our Bama screen. <laughs> Thank you. 
before we listen to the songsters this morning there are a couple of announcements prayer request please as steve uh, park stephen parks does terry's funeral on wednesday this week uh, we pray for you steve and hope that that goes really well for you and for his family together this isn't an open funeral as you will know uh, the government has suggested that only close family uh, attend funerals at the moment. Also, um, we have another service uh, tonight at 7 or 6. Oh, I'm going to have to check. Uh, on Zoom, you'll know uh, because Steve will have let you know. There is a meeting tonight at 6 on Zoom. On Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, there will be another Zoom gathering led by Steve, and that will be a, a, a Bible study, um, which will be great to get back up and going again. Wednesday at 7 o'clock, again on Zoom. Service next week uh, will be half past 10 on as usual. We're going to listen now to the songsters. A wonderful song takes me back to the 90s and we're going back to the 90s as well in the video as we uh, to Edinburgh Gorgie 1991 their songs to brigade singing I've been changed
Captain Pauline writes to us today as we consider our writes dear prayer network greetings in the name of our risen Lord Jesus whether you're able to zoom with your church family watch an online Salvation Army meeting listen to our TCZ's today message or spend time in quiet contemplation I hope that you are truly rich and blessed this Easter. Despite current world circumstances and the fear and sadness that surrounds COVID-19, I thank God that an Easter morning can still rise in our hearts and fill us with the joy of the risen Saviour. Since lockdown, we're seeing unprecedented numbers of people accessing streamed church services and many discovering new rhythms of prayer. There are good news stories emerging too. And I notice on many community Facebook pages, people pouring out the pain of loss and requests to please pray for those who have the virus. Initiatives to pray for government, the NHS and all frontline workers are increasing and are being picked up by many media platforms and even national television. This week, as we've continued in lockdown, we are all needed on the front line to continue to stand on our watch, to worship to cry out for God's mercy, to lament, and to intercede for others. I wonder also if you've paused to pray and asked the Lord what he wants to say to us, his church, in this season. Is he inviting us to listen intently and to watch and to discern how he's working out his redemptive processes and to put our trust in him alone? Is the Lord challenging us on how we do church, or army, in our case. I invite you today to rise to the challenge, to watch and pray as Jesus asked of his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, and to listen for his small, still voice in response. I'd be interested to hear from you, says Captain Pauline, if you have felt led to share. Together. Lord Jesus, please teach us how to watch and pray and listen to your voice in this season. Give us ears to hear and discernment to understand as we seek to pray your will and purposes in these strange days. We pray your kingdom come in greater and greater fullness such that individual hearts and even nations will turn back to you. Give us teachable spirits to respond to your word in prayer and action. Lord, have mercy on all those who are suffering the pain of loss. Be their comfort, Lord. Please intervene in flattening the curve for critical care treatment and bring healing for those who lie in intensive care beds. Please sustain and bless all those working in whatever way to bring care, treatment and healing to others. Lord, we have faith to believe that you alone can bring healing and wholeness to our nation and our world for the glory and honour of your name. Amen. There are some other more practical issues in our church at the moment. And we're asked to pray for the cabinet meeting that will happen on Tuesday. Captain Pauline says this, please pray for our senior leadership team the national one as they gather from their homes using life-size technology new one to me to discuss the very significant matters which are impacting our territory at this time please pray for divine wisdom insight clarity and understanding as they wrestle with the many unprecedented challenges before them in navigating our territory through the covid19 crisis may the lord strengthen them and keep them well and safe and bless them with peace in the unity of um, this week we have also as officers and employees had uh, a letter from the office of the chief secretary um, letting us know of the financial difficulty that the Salvation Army is obviously in at the moment um, the impact of the uh, coronavirus and the Salvation Army in our territory is significant uh, financially and um, 
the Chief Secretary, uh, Colonel Lee Graves, has written to us to explain a little bit. It's a very long letter and I'm not going to read it out. I'm just going to read you a small part of it for consideration um, for you as we enter this time of he writes, the Salvation Army in the UK and Ireland is a large and diverse organisation. Most people don't realise the size and complexity of the territory, even some who have been Salvationists all their lives. Here's a brief, high-level sketch of the income sources, including all cause, social centres, programmes and headquarters. We receive income from the general public, core activities and core members of more than £100 million a year. In addition, we receive £100 million per year from the UK government for contracted services. Our network of charity shops contributes just under another £10 million a year. At present, all the charity shops are closed and it's unlikely they will generate any profit this financial year. Government income for our social work should continue but there is uncertainty about donations from the general public. With most core programmes suspended, and most people to help in our communities with food parcels and other essentials, core income will fall, whilst requests for help significantly increase. In summary, the current forecast is for income to reduce by more than £40 million in the current financial year. Colonel Lee goes on to say that we do have some reserves, of course, for times such as these. But we really need to try and cut our expenditure, as well as try to think of creative ways of um, doing some fundraising. One of the things, obviously, as Deal Salvation Army, is that we don't have our meetings to take up the offering, the collection uh, and your cartridges. So this week I'm going to be sending out um, some bank forms. They have a specific number on them that links specifically to you and to Deal Core. If you lose yours, please let me know and I'll send you another one because that reference number is specific to you so you can't copy somebody else's if you lose yours. I'm going to send those round so that those of you that uh, usually do your cartridges but uh, each week can set up uh, a very simple form uh, at the bank to ensure that uh, you can continue to give that money uh, to support the work of the Salvation Army. If you don't use that form, your money will get go into the Salvation Army system and will very unlikely make it back to Deal Core. So I just want to impress upon you the importance of using that particular form that will come through the post to you. Do you have any other ideas of how we in Deal can uh, try to uh, get over this shortfall? Then please do let me know. Uh, and uh, I'm open to all sorts of suggestions and Stephen and I will, uh, will do what we can to ensure that our expenditure is used as possible so that we can continue to do the, uh, the amazing work that we have been doing and will continue to do here in Deal. Let's pray over. Father God, we just pray for the Salvation Army worldwide's financial situation at the moment. We know that this uh, financial difficulty affecting every core, and we just pray for your blessings on the money that does come in, that it will be extended and be given generosity for your kingdom, for the benefit of your work, and that it will be wisely used, each and every penny, so that your will will be on earth as it is. Amen. We're going to sing together now. Or Commissioner Anthony Cottrell brings us a sermon. Sing all over the world.
Hello, I'm really pleased to be able to greet you again uh, from uh, Territory Headquarters of the Salvation Army here in London. Um, in truth, it's been a tough month since first we started sending these messages out. Um, and I want to uh, acknowledge today that there are many people who will be watching and listening to this who will have been through some painful experiences. And I want to assure you, colleagues, employees, officers, uh, members of the Salvation Army, uh, wider members of the community who are watching this, I want to assure you of our love and our, and our prayers. Uh, some of you have uh, experienced uh, illness yourselves and others sadly have been bereaved uh, and we know of many people now who have lost their lives during the last few weeks. Our thoughts and our, and our prayers for those families affected by that uh, especially. We're also aware of course that there are many people who are doing uh, incredible work uh, in the NHS, the National Health Service, in our care homes and as key workers who are making the world still go round such as it is in these days. I especially want to again say thank you to Salvation Army workers in our residential settings. A really tough but a beautiful place to be in service. In our older people's service, in our old people's homes, in our life houses, our hostels for men and women who are homeless at this time. And also I want to acknowledge the work that's going on in our safe houses where people who have been rescued from uh, s modern slavery are being looked after. So I say thank you to those staff especially, but to everyone who is continuing to do what they can do uh, in these days. Jill and I are surrounded by a tremendous group of people uh, up and down the country actually who are in great support and, and comfort to Jill and I and great advice by many people. And um, I especially want to acknowledge um, the second in command of the Salvation Army in the United Kingdom, uh, Colonel Lee Graves. He's a Canadian officer, uh, together with his wife Debbie, are serving here alongside Jill and I. And um, uh, in the last few months, I've been having to um, orientate Lee, uh, particularly to things of the United Kingdom. I've had to introduce him to football. I've had to explain to him it would be a good thing to support Chelsea Football Club. And I've had to explain some phrases that uh, obviously are not in use in uh, Canada uh, at this time, but very much so are, is the case here in, in England. So Lee now understands what it is to be snookered. He understands uh, when I say it's time to draw stumps. And just yesterday, uh, when we received a request, uh, my response was, uh, their chance in their arm, they're having a laugh. Surely they don't expect this to happen. One of the great things of uh, the role that Jill and I have is that we get the opportunity to uh, travel throughout the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. And earlier in the year, we found ourselves in Dublin. Uh, we were there to uh, see some of the great work that's going on in, in the core that's happening there and also in the social service settings. But we had some free time and so we walked the city and found ourselves in St. Patrick's uh, Cathedral. And there in St. Patrick's Cathedral, right in the heart of, of Dublin, um, we came across a door uh, that stands um, separate from any wall. It's just there in the open space of the cathedral. And it's called the Door of Reconciliation. And the door has a big hole cut in it. You might be able to see it right now. And the story is that in 1492, two feuding families, uh, the Fitzgeralds and the Butlers, were having uh, something of a, uh, a feud, a fight. And uh, eventually the Butlers uh, ran, they retreated back towards the city centre and into the cathedral and into the chapter house particularly and they locked the door and the Fitzgeralds came but actually wanted to make peace and they asked the butlers to come out and uh, the butlers were not too keen to do this. So Gerald Fitzgerald um, ordered that a hole should be cut in the door and that's what happened. And then Gerald Fitzgerald, the leader of the Fitzgerald family, put his hand through the door, his whole arm going through the door as a gesture of peace and friendship. 
And the butlers, realizing that somebody would chance their arm, grabbed hold of the arm, shook it, and the story is that uh, the door was then unlocked, they came out, and that they went in peace. The butlers weren't the only people who ever found themselves behind a, a locked door. On the first day of the resurrection, uh, we find that Jesus appeared to the disciples in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20 and verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Verse 24. Now Thomas, called Dynamus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. And then a week later, the second Sunday, as it were, verse 26, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think Jesus is a specialist in making himself known in locked down and locked in places. Wonderfully, he does that. And typically, when he arrives, when he makes himself known, he says to the disciples, as he says to us in our lockdown places, peace be with you. Thomas, reach out your hand and put it into my side. And Thomas did just that. He reached out his arm. He put his hand into his side and he understood that this was his Lord and his God with him. I've always loved that song that John Gowans and John Larson uh, wrote together and music and words. Uh, song 649 in the songbook, which says, if crosses come, if it should cost me dearly to be the servant of my servant Lord. The second verse especially I'm drawn to at this time, and it says this, if doors should close, then other doors will open. The word of God can never be contained. His love cannot be finally frustrated by narrow minds or prison bars restrained. I'll not turn back. I'll not turn back. Whatever it may cost, I'm called to live, to love and save the lost. I always thought of those words and of the doors of opportunity. I always visualise myself as standing outside the doors and, and pushing on doors and seeing whether those are doors that I should enter into. Fresh opportunities new challenges, new directions. It wasn't until this last week when I kind of saw those words in a different context. Not of me being outside, but me being inside, locked in, locked down. And I think that we're discovering in these days that when we're confined, when we're not able to go out as perhaps once we were able to do, 
there are still amazing doors of opportunity that are opening up for us. The church is almost redefining itself in the way that we do things. The Salvation Army is understanding that we have to be followers of Jesus in different ways and we have to express the gospel in new and exciting ways. And I, for one, have discovered that in my own experience in these recent days when we have found ourselves in completely different circumstances that we ever could have envisaged even six weeks ago. I want to say that we should go on chancing our arms. We should go on endeavouring to find new opportunities. We should, as it were, reach out and discover that in reaching out that God is with us in our service, in our worship, and perhaps as was discovered in Dublin in 1492, that we should reach out our hands in terms of being reconciled, put right with God, of course, but in some circumstances for some of us to take the opportunity to be reconciled to one another, to reach out perhaps where we have been reluctant to do that previously. May it be so that in these days, we might know Jesus in the midst of us, reconciling us to himself, bringing peace to us, and thus blessing us and blessing our countries in new and exciting ways. It's time for me to draw stumps. If you don't know what that means, um, you should ask the Chief Secretary, Colonel Lee Graves. He knows what it is, but it's time for me to go. But I leave you with a blessing. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I pray this in his name. Amen.
Father God, we pray that in these difficult times you will continue to use us. You will continue to call us into your service. You will continue to inspire us to know your will and what to do when things are so very different. Lord, continue to use each of us individually. Continue to use us as a church in Deal UK. Continue to use the Salvation Army and your church globally to do your mission in this world, whatever that might look like in all the different cultures. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, is now evermore. Amen.